Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our online worship experience. So glad that you could join us this morning. On behalf of the United Methodist Church of Dent, in whose beautiful sanctuary we are filming in, uh, we would just want to welcome you to worship. So glad. So glad you could be here with us. And before we go too much further into our time of worship, I just want to give a shout out uh, to the seniors that graduated this weekend. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later on, but we want to celebrate you. Congratulations. We look forward to what God has next for you. What a wonderful accomplishment. Welcome to worship. Welcome to Ascension Sunday. Nothing in the Christian calendar is probably celebrated any less than Ascension Sunday, except maybe my birthday. But it stands at the heart of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. And on the third day, he rose again and ascended into heaven. There's that little phrase. He ascended into heaven. It's so tiny. It's so easy to overlook. Even Karl Barth acknowledged that there's a very thin line between Jesus' resurrection and his ascension. But Luke affirms, he, in the story of his gospel, he shows us that in those 40 days, between Jesus' resurrection and his ascension, when Jesus taught his disciples more about the kingdom of God, that this Ascension Sunday, this, this experience changed the disciples. They were never the same after that event. And I wonder for us this morning, if, as we engage with this text, as we listen to the scriptures being read. As we listen for God to speak us, speak to us and teach us through this passage, I wonder if that might be our experience as well, that we too will be changed as we embrace and engage with God's purpose and mission for our lives even more deeply. Let us worship the living God. Let us now engage with the call to worship. In a moment, a slide will be coming up on the screen. And if you would like to follow along in your homes, I will be reading the leader piece, and then you can read the, the, the bolded lines. I will be reading all the lines, but uh, I encourage you to follow along at home. Let us pray. Rejoice and lift praises to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We celebrate the resurrected Christ. Clap your hands and shout for joy. We celebrate the ascended Christ. Celebrate this day. We celebrate with the Spirit, who has been poured out, who calls us here, who calls us to worship. Amen. Good morning. This is uh, just one of my favorite times in the service. It's called Bragging on the Churches. And there's really, really cool stories that are happening in all the churches. So I'm just going to talk about a few of them uh, for all the churches. First, there's Dent. They took the Caravan of Joy and tweaked it just a little bit. And they used it for celebrating someone's birthday, Virgil Smith. And I heard the story. They had about seven vehicles. They drove to his driveway, which I guess is a big loop, and they drove it twice, and they rolled windows down and kind of talked through the windows, and they honked their horns, and just created a lot of joy in celebrating Virgil. I heard that Virgil had a huge grin on his face, and even his daughter was so excited about this opportunity that she, came, she drove up from Alexandria, and she got there about five minutes before the caravan left to go celebrate her dad. So 
What a great story. What a lovely story. Thank you, Dent. And then I want to give a shout out again to Dent, to the Ad Council, for the hard work that they have done in uh, thinking through how do we regather and come back? Do we come back for worship? What does that look like? How do we do that and keep people safe? And what they decided to do was to call everybody in the church and ask them, what do you think? What do you think we should do? And what do you feel comfortable with? And they pooled all of those responses back together last week and determined that the church is content to wait until possibly August or even September before they uh, regather. They're just watching this virus to see how it plays out. And I think that's really wise and commendable. So thank you, Dent, for that hard work. Then there's also Vergus. Vergus is doing good things. I want to give a shout out to Rick Nelson. Thank you so much for coming and mowing my lawn. I really appreciate it. You're a little bit like an older brother to me. A little annoying and then really, really nice. Thank you so much, Rick. I want to give a shout out to Jane Wozniak, the work that she's doing to update the usher list so that the ushers can be clear about their responsibilities as we regather with drive-in church to help keep the spacing between the vehicles uh, safe. Uh, I just really thank you for the work that you're doing on that, Jane. So thank you. And then I want to give a shout out to Sherry and Joe Dean, her husband. Um, I never call him Joe Dean. He's Jody. Um, so thank you, you guys. You guys are doing great work. You're pouring out so much energy, spending a lot of hours helping produce the best quality worship service that we can. You tweak and change things every week, trying to make it better and better. And I want to thank you for that. Sherry, thank you for all the behind the scenes work that you're doing in uh, creating systems like working with MailChimp so we can get emails out to everybody in the churches. Uh, the online giving button that has been added to our uh, web page and just things like that I'm so grateful for. And Jody, thank you for stitching together all the scenes and videos and slides to make this worship service the best we can. Thank you for your time. And then uh, I just want to say, take that coronavirus. May you choke on our resiliency and the joy that we have in the Lord. And now for our joys and concerns. Let us lift up our prayer requests for, for one another. Mike and Janelle Gettle are asking for prayers for their daughter, Allison, who is pregnant. Uh, the baby is breech, and they've been trying to turn the baby over the last couple days. So they're asking for our prayers to either help the baby uh, turn or uh, maybe the wisdom to have a C-section. They're just kind of still uh, seeing how things go, but let us pray for them. Dear Lord, we lift up Allison. We lift up this family that is anxious about this birth. Lord God, we pray that you would descend upon them and give them peace that passes all understanding. We pray, Lord God, that you would strengthen Allison, physically strengthen her body as well as her spirits, give her peace, help her to rest in you. And then for that little one, Lord God, we pray that you would turn the baby in the womb so that the baby can be born naturally. We ask that, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. And then we pray for wisdom on behalf of the doctors and the nurses that if they need to make a different decision and actually do the C-section, Lord God, we pray that that will go well and the recovery will go well. And um, we just lift them and lift her to you, Lord God, and ask for you to bless them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And then we got a call from Ruby McVean in regards to her mother, Patty. Patty was um, driven to the hospital by an ambulance. She went to the ER. She had been losing blood and had weakness in her legs. Uh, but uh, the good news is uh, a couple hours later, she was doing much better, and uh, she's going to be okay, but we still want to pray for her, so let's lift her up as well. Lord, I thank you for Ruby's passionate advocacy for her mom. She always gets the church 
praying for her mother when things are tough. And I know that that family believes in prayer. They believe that you are listening and that you are gracious and kind and you work through all our prayers. We lift up Patty to you right now, Lord God, that she might have a strong sense of your presence, of your love for her. I pray that she can rest comfortably in knowing that you are overseeing the situation. We, add, we ask that whatever this mystery is, that the doctors and nurses would be able to identify what's going on with Patty's health so that they can fix it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. I want to lift up the Frazee Church. Let us be in prayer for them. Dear Lord, we thank you for the Frazee Church, Frazee UMC, and we thank you that they have been given the green light. They have been given the permission to build their building. So Lord God, we ask that you would not only help them build a building, but that you would help them build a church. Lord God, we pray that it wouldn't simply be a transplant, but this would be a transformation that they would engage not only your mission for them in deeper and deeper ways, but Lord God, that they would catch a vision and a passion. They love their town. They love the people of Frazee. They are proud to live there and be there and worship you there. So I pray, Lord God, that you would do an amazing work through their building pro program, that you would do an amazing work as they replant themselves as a church and relaunch themselves for your glory and your purposes. Lord God, bless them mightily as they engage with that important work. And we're so excited and happy for them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And finally, Lord God, we do want to pray for our graduating seniors. We thank you so much, Lord God, that they have come to this point in their academic uh, achievements. They have graduated and we trust, Lord God, that you have great plans for them. You have amazing things that you desire for them to walk into as they grow in the knowledge of you and walk with you by faith. And Lord God, we pray that with their unique gifts, their unique talents, their unique life experiences that you have given him, we've given them, Lord, we pray that you would continue to be at work in their life. We pray that you would open doors of opportunities so that they can grow and develop and become all that you desire for them to become. Thank you, Lord God, for this wonderful weekend in which they can celebrate that amazing milestone. We celebrate with them. We're thankful to you, Lord God, how, how you have been watching over them, how you have been guiding them each step of the way. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We bring our offering, our money. We lift our very selves to you. O oh Lord, receive them as we earnestly seek to worship you, to honor you, and to reverence you with our giving. Amen. and ascended Christ. Take this offering and bless it. We pray that you would multiply it. Pressed down to overflowing, use it to be a blessing and point people to you and your never-ending love for us. Amen. Prayer of Illumination. Resurrected and ascended Lord, as we come to these holy words, this, year, this record of your last and final words to the disciples. May we hear them with fresh ears and empowered by the Spirit. Help us continue to lean into the mission you have given us, your purpose for us to be your witnesses to the ends of the earth. Amen. Today's scripture is Acts 1, verses 4 through 14. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. 
For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way. You have seen him go into heaven. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon, the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We have been living in some disoriented times, some really difficult times. I was telling my dad yesterday that everything that we do for church has changed. It's just been upended and it's all different. Um, just everything has been turned on its ear. And I just want to say, if just acknowledge the reality of that, that this feels different. It's not the same. It's not as good as getting together, but it's what we have. We have this online experience. I want to uh, do another little uh, shout out for the high school graduates, but now more specifically. Um, we know so many things have been impacted by this uh, pandemic and the coronavirus that Everything has changed. Everything has been turned on its ear. And one of those things that has been greatly impacted uh, are the graduations, the high school graduations. And I want to say here congratulations to Ellie Johnson and Becca Mull. Uh, I want to name you specifically and say congratulations to you. Good job. Well done. What an accomplishment. What a milestone. I hope you have a fun time celebrating this time of your life and uh, hopefully you will get back to rhythms of academic uh, challenges, maybe in the fall, maybe with college. Um, it's hard to know with the coronavirus, but congratulations. And during all this, it's been hard to know which way to head, uh, which direction should we go and who should we be listening to. We're all looking for good leadership and, and we're trying to, to listen carefully and find someone that can point us in a reasonable direction as we navigate this virus together. But thankfully, disorientation, it's, it's not new for us. It's not a new problem. We have had times in history that have been confusing and scary and hard like the Great Depression and World War II and 9-11. But it's been a while since it's been uh, something on this scale, right? We are still right in the middle of a global pandemic. History helps us to affirm that we're going to get through this. So this is, this is good. We can say this to one another. We're, we're going to get through this. We don't know when, but we're going we're gonna to make it through. We might uh, not have an exact date for that, and we might need to take a step back. We might have to have a few more meetings with our ad councils and, uh, to determine our next steps, to, to figure out as we re-engage what's, what's our focus going to be as we come back into our churches, what will be our purpose for coming together. It won't be easy, but we'll get through this, and we'll get back on track. And that's maybe why I appreciate this text for us this morning so much. This text, this passage of scripture, 
It reveals just how confused the disciples were. They were continually looking in the wrong direction. It's almost a little bit slapstick humorish as we go through the text. Uh, it's almost funny how consistently they get it wrong. Because argu arguably they had the best leader and the best teacher in the world, in all of history, in the Son of God, in Jesus. And he had been with them for three years, walking and talking and eating. And, and now the Son of God, he has been newly raised from the dead and he spent 40 days after his resurrection with more teaching uh, again and explaining things again in more details but the disciples just didn't get him and they didn't know which way to look and they were confused about their mission so this text is a good reminder for us this morning that if the disciples the followers of Jesus back then struggled well, it helps us know that we're probably going to struggle too. It's comforting. Um, we've probably been looking in the wrong direction once in a while, but uh, it's so of the disciples. But the risen Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever, and he will be faithful to redirect us. We are going to follow the movement in this text. And uh, first... We are looking forward. Jesus is inviting a forward-looking uh, momentum and energy and, and direction. But then we'll be looking backwards, so then we'll be looking up, and maybe even looking down, and then we're going to be looking, uh, looking back up again. It makes me a little queasy to act out all this movement, but it's where we're headed this morning. So pay attention to that from the text. So we start out with looking forward. Over lunch, Jesus commands them, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised you, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Jesus had talked to them about the Spirit before. This is nothing new for the disciples, but, the, but now what's different is the time is coming. The time is soon. It's just a few days away now. Uh, that the Father will then send a helper, an advocate, another friend to give them the strength and power they need to keep following Jesus and living into their mission. Jesus is very familiar with the work and power of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit has been with us since the creation of the world. He was brooding over the waters in the book of Genesis. He has been enabling Jesus to do his, his ministry, to teach and to preach and perform miracles. The spirit, of, the spirit in the form of a dove descended upon Jesus at his baptism. And most recently, the Spirit has raised Jesus from the dead. As we look at Romans chapter 8, verse 11, it gives us this great promise. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you... He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Jesus had the spirit's help to rise from the dead, and we who hope in Christ can experience the Holy Spirit empowering us in our daily living, too. And maybe that's all you take out of the sermon this morning. Uh, maybe that's it, just that knowledge that the Holy Spirit is alive and active in your life, giving strength and life to your mortal body. But you know, if you do take that, and you take that in, if that's your main takeaway, and you can trust in the Holy Spirit's influence and guidance in your life, you will be radically empowered. And that would be worth it right there. You can thank me later. Jesus knew his disciples then and now would need help to fulfill the mission to accomplish the purposes the Lord has for his followers. Jesus was giving them something amazing to be looking forward to, happening, looking forward. But then note how the disciples respond to Jesus' exciting promise coming to them uh, in just a few days. They gather around Jesus, they're all excited, 
and they ask this seemingly unrelated question. A question out of left field. A question that seems so off track. And when they, when they ask in verse 6, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel now? Their response is quite telling. They weren't tracking. Instead, they were looking in the wrong direction. They were looking backward, like way back into their collective faith history and to the numerous passages in the Old Testament that promised Israel would one day be restored. And Jesus, he did not rebuke them for asking this question. It wasn't completely out of bounds, but it did show what the disciples were most concerned about. They were focused on the concrete. They were focused on their immediate needs. Uh, they were wondering, now will we be vindicated for following Jesus? Will we share in the wealth and the power of Jesus' kingdom? They were looking for some ease and some glory and some power. They were tired of all the highs and lows of following Jesus. They were tired of living in fear of the oppression of the Romans. They were tired of disorientation. And they wanted something more. You know, something more. They wanted something more normal and substantial. And I can relate. Aren't we a bit tired of all the unknowns, the ups and downs, the ambiguity? There's no fixed date in which we can get back to normal. We have a five-phased plan now from Bishop O based on the virus. He just sent it out this last week. And I relate with being tired of the dread of the coronavirus. It's just hanging over our heads. I get these disciples. But they are denied. Jesus clearly sets a boundary. It was not for the disciples to know. The times or dates when Israel would be restored. The Father is going to handle that. As for the virus, we too have boundaries established for us. Boundaries that we are going to abide by. As we respect the bishop and respect our DS. As we respect and revere each other. Seeking uh, the needs and concerns of others over our own and keeping the most vulnerable in our congregations safe. Our bishop sent out some guidelines and God wants us to hold to those boundaries. I really believe that. To prove our love for God by honoring the safety of others. To keep the most Vulnerable, safe, like I said, and we have, you know, we have boundaries. We've talked about them, and they're all out, all out there, like six feet apart, and hand sanitizer, uh, wearing masks, and we can do this. We can do this. Now back to the boundary that Jesus established, where it, he said it's not for you to know the date and time. Again, Jesus redirects them back to their primary mission in verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Frazee and in all Dent and Virgus to the ends of the earth. That's our equivalent of you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Jesus was reminding them that they were not primarily historians or theologians of the Old Testament. Nor were they going to be politicians or governors or were they even going to be primarily Jewish. The Jews back then were absolutely fixated on when Israel would be restored. The Jews were so obsessed and single-minded on the physical and political restoration of Israel as a kingdom so obsessed that many Jews could not see Jesus for who he was, and they rejected him, just like Judas Iscariot. When Jesus did not restore Israel as a nation on Judas's timeline, he ditched Jesus. 
He betrayed Jesus because Jesus wasn't restoring Israel in the way that he expected Jesus to do. Jesus reminds the disciples of who they are, of their mission, of their purpose. Jesus redirects them to where they are to look. And it's almost like grandma grabbing a kid by the cheeks and looking directly in their eyes. And, and in this instance, it would be Jesus clearly looking in the eyes of his disciples and saying to them, you will be my witnesses. And then to underscore how important this re- redirection was, after he said this, he is taken up before their eyes. Jesus immediately ascends. He leaves. No more questions, guys. No more discussion. This is it, brothers. Be my witnesses. And he drifts up and up and away. And those poor disciples were left completely gobsmacked, mouths hanging open, lunch falling out. What in the world? They're flat footed and dumbfounded. They had never seen anything like that before. It's like when a helium balloon is released. And all eyes watch Jesus gently go up and up and up. And he ascends. And then they're just left standing there, staring intently into the sky. Until suddenly two angels, dressed in white, appear by their side and drag their focus back down to earth. They might have landed with a thud even. And they're grounded back to Reality with their question, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? Jesus, who ascended, will one day return just like he left. Again, they were looking in the wrong direction. They were caught looking up and needed help to get back back on point with their mission. When Jesus finished his statement of you will be my witnesses, And left them, That's they just kept looking up in the sky. He dramatically and miraculously underscored how important his last words were. He went up. Nothing else needed to be said. Nothing else had to be added. And now the disciples were going to tell stories of who Jesus was. That was what it means. That's what it means to be a witness. That was going to be their focus. They were not primarily... Uh, meteorologists, meteorologists looking to the clouds, they would not be allowed to be too spiritually minded to be of any earthly good. They could not keep their heads in the clouds. They needed help to get back to earth on solid ground, back to the mission. They were witnesses of Jesus and all that he had done. And now they can add this. Jesus ascended up to heaven right before our eyes. We all saw it. It really did happen. Jesus wanted them to look forward to the Holy Spirit and his, he- and his help so that they could succeed in being his witnesses. But they looked backward. And then when Jesus rose and ascended, they were found looking up. And now in this final verse, verses 12 through 14, the disciples walked back to their hotel room, the room where they were staying. And I wish I could have listened in on what they were talking about between the Mount of Olives and their hotel room in Jerusalem. I wonder if they shuffled along with their heads down. Maybe they were looking down primarily now. Or maybe they were looking around at each other, just stunned, silent, maybe shrugging and scratching their heads. What did all of this mean? And when is Jesus coming back? The mission had been given, and the spirit for us now has been poured out. In this way, we are not like the early disciples. Uh, We don't have to wait. The Holy Spirit has been given to us. He lives inside of us. He will give us strength to talk about Jesus, to point to the risen and now ascended Lord, to press into our mission, our common purpose of sharing God's love for everyone. So where are we in that? Are we looking back? Are we looking back to what church used to be? You know, all all you had to do was show up. It was pretty easy. 
and the churches were full and they were active and there was all these activities and it was the golden age of church. Do we simply want to get back to normal? Maybe that's where we're, at, where we're at right now. Maybe we're looking back, but we just want to get back to normal, like what was, what was there for us, like in March. Are we still dreaming of when our churches used to be full and happening, and maybe we aren't all that concerned um, about sharing Jesus or being his witnesses? Or are we looking up? Maybe we're looking for God or someone else, anyone else, to do this hard work for us. Someone has to be adulting better than I am. That hard work of being God's people and sharing God's love in creative and new ways. Yeah, that takes some thought. It takes some intentionality. I get that. But so far, you know what? No one else... No one else has showed up to tell us what to do. We can wait, but I don't think anybody else is coming along. We're it. I'm pretty sure I didn't sign up for this, being his witness during a pandemic. But here we are. Or can we look forward? Can we plan for our future together? Can we trust that God will help us make plans, help us match his mission to our unique time and place and gifts and abilities and life experiences in the world the way it really is now and that it will be doable and fruitful and life-giving? Can we trust that God, the Holy Spirit, will help us be generous to do acts of kindness, offer words of comfort, and simply tell others, Jesus loves you. I think Jesus loves us at least that much. I think I've got enough faith for that. That we can trust Jesus wants us to have something positive and good to look forward to. You know, like being his witnesses. This is an announcement for all the churches. All the online Bible studies have concluded for the summer. Keep your eyes peeled for the fall when new ones will start up again. In Dent, I've already mentioned this, but they have decided to wait until August or September to regather for worship. They will be reviewing the virus and how it unfolds week by week and month by month. And a letter will be going out to the whole congregation on Monday. Frazee, if you have a prayer request, text Rosemary Sandow and she will repost your text exactly to the rest of the congregation. Uh, We might be having another Ad Council meeting this Wednesday via Zoom to revisit how we will regather for worship safely. In Vergas, you will be having a drive-in worship service starting Sunday, June 7th at 10.30 a.m. in your parking lot. Looking forward to seeing you then. And then I want to show you uh, an idea I had this week. It's called Pastor's Hours. Um, Just give me a call, schedule a visit. We can sit in my driveway, six feet apart, uh, observing safe social distancing practices. And we just talk. Uh, I'd encourage you to bring your own lawn chair. But I'm here for you. I miss you. Let's have a visit and see how God might bless our time together. And now for the sending forth. Maybe you are looking backwards. You're looking at the good old days, the golden days of church when it was just so easy. You just showed up and there were so many people. Or maybe you're looking up in awe, but kind of maybe waiting for somebody else to come. Or maybe you are looking around, we're looking around confused. Well, this week the sending forth is... I encourage you to look to the risen and ascended Lord. Ask him this week how you can fulfill his purpose and his mission for you and for us. How can we as the church be loving our neighbor and our family and our coworkers and our friends at church? Maybe loving the cashier at the grocery store. Uh, 
Let us be in prayer for how we too can be the Lord's witnesses this week, witnessing to the love that God has for people. And now, dear friends, receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen and amen. <laughs>